Thank you very much. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real privilege to be here and to have the opportunity to, ad to address this meeting, in particular after this, what I consider to be exceedingly inspirational opening. And in many ways, I will continue the arguments that you have heard from, from colleagues who participated in the opening. Um, in particular, I will argue that the modern energy services are a prerequisite for development in general and human well-being, and therefore are indeed a missing development goal. And so all of the priorities, in my view, need to be directed toward achieving this really important goal in the future. Now, what I will say builds on the work of my colleagues at the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis in Austria, but also of the Global Energy Assessment, and some pamphlets are there if you want to find out more or just send me an email. But basically, the Global Energy Assessment is very similar to what IPCC does in the climate area. The assessment is looking at the energy issues in a comprehensive way and a possible ways forward. Um, there are about 250 experts and scientists putting the assessment together. Right now, it is in the review process with about 200 anonymous reviewers. The work will finish end of the year, and there will be a book by Cambridge University Press in April next year. So I will just like to give you some my own personal impressions of the findings so far. So as I mentioned, the most important in the assessment is the access to energy, but one should not forget ecosystem services such as food and water. So energy, food and water, it all goes together. One cannot really unbundle them. And therefore, one can see energy as a prerequisite also for producing sufficient food, but also for making water available for human activities. So there is no doubt that energy services, in my view, are prerequisite for other Millennium Development Goals. Now, let me try to illustrate this to you very quickly, and I'm doing it schematically because we don't have that much time. This is from a series of pictures from Peter Menzel. He has made pictures of people around the world with all of their belongings. This is a family. There is no picture? That's too bad. It's a nice picture. <laughs> I'll tell you what it is until you can see it. Uh, it's basically a, a picture of uh, people with their belongings. This is a family in Mali with everything that they have. Uh, it's there. Everything that, you, that they have. And you can see that much of their belongings are related to cooking with traditional energy in a very unsustainable manner. In fact, if you look at the left, uh, at the right, uh, the right side of panel, you can see there is some rel relatively low quality fuel wood. Now, the only thing that's more than there, I, I wonder whether you can discern it, is a bicycle in the background and a transistor radio next to the head of the house. Now, let me tell you that the transistor radio is the most expensive way of getting energy because you're running off the batteries, so they're basically unaffordable. And these are the people with almost no purchasing power. Now, just as an example, the Sub-Saharan Africa, people in Sub-Saharan Africa pay twice as much for their electricity, if they even have a connection, than the people in the OECD. They pay on the order of 26 to 30 euro cents per kilowatt hours. And you check your electricity bills, and you'll see what the big difference is. On top of it, there are about 700 megawatts of diesel generating power for productive uses because there is no access to electricity. That usually costs even double that amount, maybe 40 to 50 euro cents. So you can see that the poorest pay the highest. To electrify sub-Saharan Africa, where about we would need to connect about 500 million people in sub-Saharan Africa who are not connected today, would require quadrupling the current installed capacity to maybe about 20,000 uh, megawatts. Now, that's one single Three Gorges Dam, so it's clearly doable if you put priorities in that direction, or it's an installed capacity of a country like Venezuela or Romania. Now, let me show you a little bit more clearly this, um, the, this um, uh, diversity in the world. And Ambassador Kamal uh, talked about too much and too little. On this map, you can see too much and too little. Let me just walk you to it very quickly. Uh, the darker the color, the higher the population density. That means more people live per square kilometer. As you walk from blue, these are the affluent countries that one could argue use too much. You've heard Junkela say 10,000 
kilo, kilowatt hours per year. Average global is 2,000 in Africa. Even if you have access, they'll be well below 100. Uh, 100 kilowatts a year. Now, the red are the people without access, and uh, you can see I've put some numbers together. One can say that half of the world, over 3 billion people, either have no access at all or have inadequate access. That means they, they either cook with traditional fuels, have to buy batteries for light and for transistor radios, and basically have no access to energy. The other half have benefited from the Industrial Revolution, and the other half, that's those those who live in the northern hemisphere have access. So that's, that's the, the, the situation. Um, there is a big need for access in the Indian subcontinent, but in particular in the rural Africa, as I mentioned before. Um, now, the, if you just compare these two pictures, so you see dark red areas as are people who are without access, let's say on the order of two and a half, between one and a half and two and a half billion around the world. This is a map of the incidence on health Junkel also referred to that, life years lost, and incidence of diseases related to the indoor air pollution. You can see in the north, in Europe, it's also red. This is a particular matter from industrial activities, but in sub-Saharan Africa and in the other parts of the world that are developing where it's dark red, it is mostly unsustainable use of energy indoors. So this is a potential huge co-benefit, direct huge co-benefit, and I'll end up with that in my brief comments, huge co-benefit for doing the energy right. The other planetary concern is climate change, and you heard about that also in the opening, and I'm just reproducing here what is called the rand amber or barometers of concern about climate change. On the left, for example, you have the systems that are already threatened today because they're unique and because we have already increased the global temperature by about 0.7 degrees since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Three billion have benefited for that. Three billion who do not have the adaptive capacity because they're poor and do not have the access will suffer a lot. So this is yet another asymmetry in the world. On the right of this graph, you can see big discontinuities at current. We are not all that concerned about that. But this was 10 years old. This is from the third assessment report of IPCC. Here is what was just uh, published by the US Academy of Sciences, an update of the information. The black curve horizontally is zero degrees. That's current temperature. And you can see that the degree of concern has increased. So this is four degrees. Four degrees would happen if you continue business as usual. That's pretty much pre-programmed, and you can see that it's, it's a, why this is a major planetary concern. This would be a three degrees, a major changes in the, in the global energy system, and this would be two degrees, what was agreed in the Copenhagen Accord, and it's a policy of many countries around the world to try to achieve two degrees. So let me try to put all of this together, basically. So what we need is the um, Secretary General's Advisory Group on Energy and Climate Change has suggested Achieving universal access by 2030 is a primary goal. We also, in that report, concluded that we should have, and Junkela referred to it, our chair, that energy intensity should decline by 40%. That means vigorous improvement in energy efficiency. And the third one that would benefit from those two measures is radical decarbonization in the world. That would go toward the climate goal. So I think we really need to have three essential goals. Access on my list is number one, efficiency number two, because it has many co-benefits, and then three is sustainable way forward in terms of climate. So let me show you this graph. I think it illustrates our dilemma, if you wish. That's the second dilemma. Ambassador Kamal talked about the first one with too much and too little energy. Here you can see the historical emissions of carbon dioxide in the world since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, to which we owe some of the high affluence that we have in certain parts of the world. The emissions have been increasing at about 2% per year historical rate exponentially. And you can see basically alternative future developments. The brown curve on top is the four degree future. That's if we do almost nothing and continue like we have been acting in the past. The green curve that curves middle of the century is the three degree scenario. So that, if you remember, causes lots of concerns about future climate change and the sustainability and existence of people who do not have the adaptive capacity, do not have access to energy. So this is where the loop closes. And the one that's green, the below, shows how the emissions should look like if we want to head for 
2 degrees. And 40% efficiency improvement e is a way to go there. Uh, but you can see that we would need to reduce the emissions by 2030 by about 50%. That means universal access by 2030, reduction of energy intensities by 40%, and emissions by 50%. So efficiency can do a lot of it. This is why these three goals hang together. But by 2050, we need to be around 80% reduction. That means OECD countries, zero emissions. That's daunting if you think about it, but it's important to have aspirational goals. Otherwise, we are not likely to do much. And then last comment is in the second half of the century, uh, you can see that this dips below, below. It's, it's net negative. So how could that happen? Well, one possible technology is sustainable biomass with carbon capture and storage. Both technologies are proven. In both technologies, we have to invest. And so you can see that a certain symmetry emerges here. The historical emissions going up, if you want to go for two degrees, we have to immediately go.